very good morning to you all welcome back to the 15th international research conference kdu on economical revival national security and sustainability through advancement of science technology and innovation we are about to commence the first technical session of the faculty of criminal justice on the sub theme of national security and sustainability through research in criminal justice the chair for the first technical session is deshabandhu professor jeeva niriyala dean faculty of criminal justice professor niriyala is the founding dean of the faculty of criminal justice and professor in law at university of colombo she was one of the members of the steering committee of setting up the faculty of criminal justice the judges of the session are honorable high court judge mr lakmal vikramasuriya deputy director of sri lanka judges institute and retired high court judge honorable spk ekaratna i would like to invite the chair deshabandhu professor jivani riyalla to deliver the preliminary remarks over to you madam very good morning to you all after a very successful preliminary session today we are here to start the technical sessions so as we all are aware we have two technical sessions uh, the first one there are uh, few uh, scholars are presenting their papers and after tea there will be another session then the rest of the authors are, will be presenting their papers so without much taking much time i would like to invite the high honorable high court judge mr lakmal vikramasuriya uh, to come uh, to come to the uh, the desk and to uh, start our the program technical session today uh, we are waiting for the second discussant rather the second judge of this program today he is former judge of court of appeal uh, techni uh, honorable high court judge kumar ekaratna so until he comes i thought that we have to start the uh, the proceedings yes thank you very much the honorable high court judges the discussants and the judges today for the technical session there are five papers will be presented by actually they many of them are from our faculty Uh, relating to their re research research findings so each and every presenter will be given 12 minutes for his or her presentation so there are two times they will be shown the time that they will be left Uh, to continue their presentation so once their presentation is over then we can go for the next presenter so after all the five presenters will be presenting their papers we will have the question and answer session then after that that can be the technical session can be summarize all the papers would be summarized by the chair of this particular technical session today but however i thought that this is since this is a learning curve a learning exercise if the two judges who are sitting uh, with me if they also can contribute by asking questions making comments and suggestions they also will be given the opportunity uh, to do so so without taking much time i thought that to invite the first speaker she is dr nishara mendis she will be presenting her paper on the title reason uh, reasons and road map for integrating the arts and humanities into criminal justice education uh good morning dear chairperson and honorable judges Uh, and students um so today i'm going to start off the technical sessions uh, with something related to criminal justice education 
So I hope that uh, this will be interesting for all of you and uh, also give you some food for thought for uh, what could be done in the future in this particular area of uh, integrating arts and humanities into criminal justice education. Now, I also have two keywords here, reasons for doing so and a roadmap for doing so. So I hope I might convince you uh, that this is something that is important to do for your own education in criminal justice. And I hope that I will have uh, other, let's say, supporters later on, but I'm also open to any questions and criticism because this is a very preliminary presentation with the hope of future research. So the contents of my presentation are such, uh, structured in this manner. Um, I will also mention a literature review within my uh, contents uh, so that uh, you have some idea of the type of research that is already being done uh, so that you can see the reasons for my recommendations. Okay, so the introduction, why am I thinking about this particular topic? The police public relationship is a matter of interest for all of us. The police, as well as the members of the public, have in recent years, I think, had a bit of a strained or stressful relationship. Uh, there is a lot of talk in the media about distrust of both the justice system and criminal justice professionals. Often there is a mention that people see them as unsympathetic or unempathetic to the needs and feelings of the general public. So in this context, is there something that we can do during criminal justice education to maybe uh, develop certain uh, skills to express our empathy towards each other? Now, um, in terms of research on this topic of empathy, there has been some comments to the um, uh, two to different viewpoints. One says that those who join the criminal justice field are prone uh, or have a predisposition to less empathy and that that is the reason why they join this field. Uh, now, this is something that has come out of research, but you may not agree with it uh, personally. Uh, however, there has been some studies, and therefore, this is an added reason, I think, for attempting to develop greater sensitivity and thoughtfulness in both teaching and learning of these uh, fields, uh, this subject. Now, other than that, there is the need for actually a higher level than normal of empathy when it comes to professionals in this field because it is so important for professionals in this field to understand other people's feelings and also one's own feelings so that you can express yourself clearly to others in a criminal justice setting. So I would say ultimately the ability for empathetic communication can both prevent disputes and also lead to rehabilitation and reconciliation in society. So summing up, the key word in my presentation is going to be empathy. I believe that for future law enforcement officers, engagement with the humanities is essential it is essential preparation for working together with people whose view of the world might be different from your own. So the need to understand other people should be a vital part of your education. So the objectives of this paper are to highlight the importance of integrating arts and humanities into criminal justice education, in particular where the individuals will be trained as officers who will be directly involved in the interactions with accused, persons, convicted persons, victims, victims' families, and the general public on a daily basis. Um, the objective also is to encourage steps for further research and implementation in Sri Lanka. The methodology in this paper is going to be an analytical review of current findings, drawing from comparative findings in medical humanities with a view to supporting the arguments for integrating arts and literature in teaching and learning criminal justice. Um, now, uh, let me just highlight, medical humanities is a far more well-developed area than uh, humanities and criminal justice, and I will uh, um, expand on that a little bit as well. 
Furthermore, the practical implementation of uh, integrating arts and humanities in certain degree programs and courses uh, currently in uh, comparative jurisdictions will also be discussed. Okay, so this is uh, a short uh, uh, lit review of medical humanities research. And uh, you can see that the word empathy keeps coming up in this literature reviews. Um, how you would um, uh, approach teaching medicine uh, so that you can create more empathetic doctors. Uh, and this is a field that has been studied a lot. Now I know some of you all even in your lectures were asking me about issues of medical professionals and comparing medical and criminal justice professionals uh, as well. And you know it's a hot topic of discussion the last few days in social media and even today in the morning before I came for this uh, particular session there was a discussion about uh, the professionalism and uh, the behavior of uh, medical professionals. So uh, these two professions I think there is something that can be compared and something that can be learned. Now when it comes to Sri Lanka, medical humanities has actually been quite advanced within the last 25-30 years to the extent that there is actually a department of medical humanities in the Colombo Medical Faculty. And there has already been an international conference on medical humanities uh, where there were presentations from local and international presenters. So this is a very well developed area. And if you are going to compare the importance of empathetic professionals in these two professions, I think there is much that can be learned from medical humanities research that has already happened. Now, there has also been research in criminal justice and humanities as well. So you can see that this is a, a more recent field, uh, well developed uh, in the last few years. What are the benefits of integrating arts and humanities uh, into criminal justice education? As I have already said, uh, they will provide many useful skills for the professionals that make them more socially and historically aware, more self-reflective and more humane, or that is like the um, idea that we hope to achieve. To grasp and respond to multiplicity of perspectives, it's uh, something that you can learn through art, literature, and humanities. And uh, when you are facing so many difficult scenarios in your work, perhaps this sensitivity will help you choose more nuanced and sensitive responses, and also build up a sense of a community which respects a diversity of different opinions and lifestyles. I think there will be an increased satisfaction on the part of the service receivers uh, when you have uh, criminal justice professionals uh, who have that kind of empathy. Now on the part of the criminal justice professionals themselves also there are personal and professional benefits that have been noted from the medical humanities field uh, which I think might be useful for you as well because both of these fields are very high stress and um, very uh, sort of difficult in terms of uh, how you can cope or can maybe cannot cope with the job pressures. So an increase in personal satisfaction, competence, and a reduction of overall dissatisfaction and burnout in the profession might be possible when there is more engagement with the humanities. It also, I think, uh, will kindle your curiosity, your imagination, and your empathetic and critical thinking as part of a practice of lifelong learning. So how would you introduce this? What is the roadmap for introducing uh, this uh, into, let's say, our own criminal justice uh, teaching? One of the extreme ways or big ways would be actually to have a BA, such as the BA at Northeastern University and the BA at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. These are key uh, very important international uh, training programs or degree programs which are highly respected and you can do a joint degree. However, maybe this is far too soon to do something like that in Sri Lanka and it is uh, something which, which is being pioneered in the United States but we are probably not yet ready on it. There is a possibility of introducing a course module on criminal justice, arts and humanities to existing syllabuses. 
that is also something that may take a little time. Certificate courses, on the other hand, are very possible. So I think there is a possibility we could develop something like that in maybe within the next five years. Um, in a sooner timeline, we could perhaps organize series of workshops and seminars for credit, develop reading recommendation lists for each of our criminal justice subjects. Then there are also things that you can do as extracurricular activities, such as a film library and a film club, where there are monthly uh, film shows where you can discuss things that are relevant uh, to your field. There could also be drama club, poetry club, art, and music clubs, which um, develop your sensitivity and empathy uh, and your uh, critical thinking skills as well while you enjoy yourself um, and gain something uh, for maybe lifelong uh, development. So there could be so many things that I think could happen within the next, let's say, two to three years. Then there is a timeline for five years to 10 years. Um, and these, I think, we could plan as a roadmap of how to get to a stage where uh, humanities um, is uh, integrated into criminal justice education. Um, and for teachers currently teaching, I think making recommendations for students to access on their own time or making material part of the teaching itself is something that could be done during lectures um, and discussion classes. So one final point. Uh, as my time is now running up, is that reflective personal portfolios is something that in medical humanities has been said to uh, encourage uh, these objectives that we talked about. And I think that this is also something perhaps that could be encouraged in the criminal justice uh, teaching and learning as well. And uh, I think there is an introduction of reflective portfolios into our current curriculum. So, uh, I'm right on time. Uh, I hope I have convinced you that we should be integrating arts and humanities into criminal justice education based on the ongoing research, the current research, and the comparative things that we can learn from the field of medical humanities. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nishara. Uh, so we'll uh, move to the second speaker. Uh, he's uh, Ms. P.C. Katri Arachi. Her presentation will be Accountability of the Combatants in Asthmatic Warfare with Special Reference to Findings in the Darusman Report. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as my presentation today, I have selected uh, a quite a contentious topic, uh, accountability of the combatant in asymmetric warfare with special reference to findings in the Darusman report. So although it uh, looks a little contentious, my objective of selecting this topic was not to uh, uh, understand, uh, to find fault with uh, any personality or individual or any entity who have combated the 30-year war in our country. The topic I have selected is in par with our main theme, the national security is a core component of our main theme of the IRC 2022. So the objective of uh, uh, taking this topic was to understand where we have gone wrong in the 30-year-old war when we were fighting a lethal ruthless terrorist uh, community, terrorist group in the country, and in the process of uh, winning the battle against them, whether we have made any errors and how we can overcome that, not to find anybody accountable really. How we can overcome that and how an academic could involve in this process of educating the parties to engage in war if we have to in future, we do not know. Hopefully, we will hope that we will not be able to experience such an experience in future. But while maintaining law and order and uh, maintaining, uh, ensuring national security, we have to ensure that our forces, our troops, and our police, and our responsible entities are properly educated. 
So uh, here are the contents of my presentation. So we need to have a look at what is asymmetric warfare. So we, under international humanitarian law and other laws of war, we fight wars in a conventional setting. The 90% of the laws that we have, we are learning under IHL, are meant for wars fought in a conventional setting. But what is asymmetric warfare? Asymmetric warfare is, in other words, it is unconventional warfare. Sometimes we use the words guerrilla warfare. Guerrilla warfare may be a more convenient term to understand unconventional warfare. So what is asymmetric warfare or guerrilla warfare or unconventional warfare? When in a battle, when the parties are not equal in power, in terms of uh, manpower, in terms of weaponry, so we call it, we, uh, so the parties who are less powerful in those terms, they tend to resort to means and methods of warfare which are not conventional and which are not standard, which are not to be in par with the international laws or rules of engaging in war. So we fought such a warfare with the LTTE, although our forces, the state forces, were legitimate force who has a legitimate right to fight against the belligerents uh, to ensure national security, because national security has to be there to ensure all other freedoms, all other rights to the people of the country. So in an asymmetric warfare, the belligerents, the parties who are less powerful, they tend to use certain tactics like mainly taking human shields and resorting to uh, unreasonable or excessive means and methods of warfare. In such a situation, even if the state army is well trained and legitimate, so how are they going to face such, a, uh, such an opposing enemy? And when in facing such an enemy, can you fight a conventional warfare? And if so, if you also cannot fight, even if the legitimate army cannot fight a conventional warfare, so what, where we could go wrong? And what are the mistakes that we could make in terms of committing certain maybe crimes or maybe certain other errors on the battlefield. So in my uh, small research, I have selected a sample of uh, 30 uh, commissioned officers and uh, non-commissioned officers uh, who have been engaged in the war during, uh, during the war, before that is the 2009, before the end of the war. And I conducted uh, some in-depth interviews to understand uh, what has gone wrong, if anything has gone wrong, or whether has anything gone wrong actually, because as a state, we have to clear our name in the eyes of the international community. If we do not clear our name legitimately, according to the law, then that means that we are in other, other way, uh, indirectly, we are taking the blame for anything has happened, maybe from the other side. So uh, the Darusman report was uh, taken as a consideration, not that it is uh, quite authenticated by any other means, but just to see what are the allegations that had been leveled against the forces and also for the other side, the LTTE. So as shown on the screen, here are some of the allegations made against our uh, security forces. Then during the interviews, what I wanted to know was, what were their real battleground experiences in fighting the enemy? So with that, where we could support in future to overcome these issues. I have made a comprehensive literature review as well to understand the situations of uh, the uh, fights or wars of such na nature which had taken place in other countries, in other contexts. Here's my sample for you to have a glance at. All of these uh, personalities, uh, they have been actively engaged in the war zone. 
before 2009. And uh, they, they did not uh, come up with any uh, you know, unwanted, unrevealable uh, matters uh, with me. Uh, we have had a very uh, in-depth discussion as to what are the methods that they recommend to overcome uh, anything in future. So uh, if we talk about the past experiences, from the recommendations and their views, what has been taken into note was that we will have to enhance education on this field, especially on the IHL and human rights perspectives. So when I was interviewing, the, most of my interviewees, they did not have a precise knowledge on the understanding of IHL and HR, International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights. The distinction between these two laws were not very clear to most of the interviewees. So we will have to educate them as to what is applicable in times of war and what is applicable in times of peace and where these two laws are merged. Because international humanitarian law directly applies in times of war and international human, human rights law mainly applicable in times of peace, but there is a situation where these two laws overlap. That means if we adhere to the laws of war, that means we are protecting the rights of the parties, not only the parties engaged in war, but also the general civilian population. So that is a must because protection of the rights is the main idea of introducing international humanitarian law for the context of war, whether it's conventional warfare or asymmetric warfare. So then the next point, the next uh, issue that which came up during the interviews was that uh, the combi combined training, the combined training between the tri forces, the, uh, the army, the navy, and the air force, they had to be increased. The, the number of joint forces training, the situ instances of joint forces training was not sufficient at that point according to their view. So we have to understand now we have military personnel in all three forces who have, most of them, have not seen or experienced such a situation. So we, uh, now if you take uh, an officer or a soldier who had completed more than 20 years, they have seen this war with the LTT as well as some of them may have seen the insurgency during the JVP insurrection. But now we have to understand, we have to make a survey and see whether are we ready at the moment to face future situations. Are we ready? Have we trained them properly? Have we given them joint forces training? Have we educated them properly on the laws of war, on laws of human rights, and how we uh, combine them when it comes to a practical applicability? Have we given them su sufficient training with on-ground uh, narrated situations? Then uh, a main uh, discussion was whether a superior commander uh, in the battleground could maintain his command during a heavy battle. So in a non-conventional setting, although we plan ahead for an operation, we will have to face unforeseen circumstances because the enemy is taking human shield, the enemy may adopt uh, certain guerrilla tactics, which the uh, commander on ground will have to face and act according to the situation. Spontaneously, he will ha have to take decisions on ground. Then on the other hand, the commanders would be replaced by new commanders during the war if the, com the superior is killed or injured and taken out of the battleground. Then we have to understand whether the troops under command, they are ready to listen to or the, uh, obey the new command understanding their limitations of exercising their powers of uh, using, making warfare on ground spontaneously. So just giving a, a book, textbook understanding 
of the laws, would it be sufficient? So my interviewees, all their, most of them, the 90% of them were on the view that we will have to study experiences. We have to take experiences from other situations and narrate situations, on-ground situations, with joint forces training to educate the personnel already uh, in the army who, who have not uh, seen or experienced the uh, battleground situation. So as academics, I think we will have to, uh, we will have to uh, shoulder a big responsibility because if we give that responsibility of developing military manuals or training purely to the forces, then sometimes the, there would be a gap in understanding the real concepts of law. Sometimes there could be a general understanding of the concepts of law, but we have to impart the precise knowledge to the troops. So uh, the, both the forces from that side, the responsible authorities from the, that side, and the academics, they will have to ha go uh, embark upon a joint venture in imparting knowledge. So I suppose, I believe that uh, in our uh, course curriculum also for the third year, we have uh, international crimes and uh, international human, human rights law and, uh, uh, and to a certain amount of international humanitarian law. So it is our responsibility to disseminate knowledge uh, in par with the changing situations of the, uh, of the country. So here are some, con uh, I have mentioned some of the recommendations as my last uh, opinions. So I have come to the conclusion of my presentation. Thank you very much. And I welcome any uh, questions at the later stage of this session. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Katriya Rachi. Now we'll uh, move to the third speaker. She is A.H. Uh, Vijaya. She will be speaking on free menstrual syndrome and women criminality applicability to pre-menstrual syndrome as a criminal defense in the Sri Lankan context. Everybody, mm, today I'm going to discuss about the pre-menstrual menstrual syndrome as a criminal defense in Sri Lankan context. It is a comparative analysis. Uh, I'll move to the first slide. Uh, this is the introduction part. Pre-menstrual syndrome or PMS is a group of psychological and physical symptoms experienced by women who are in their reproductive age prior to their menstruation. And its etiology or the cause is unknown up to now and the prevalence is vary to community to community. Then significant behavioral, behavioral changes could be seen in the women who are suffering from PMS such as aggression, and depression, irritability, mood swings, and anxiety. Those are the symptoms that can be seen the women who are suffering from PMS. And various researchers have been conducting researches for about 30 years to reveal the nature of behavioral change of severe PMS and women criminality. And they have uh, explored that there is a close relationship between the women criminality and, the, and PMS. And many criminal justice system allow female suspect to plead PMS as a diminished responsibility to mitigate their punishment. Diminished responsibility means it's an abnormal state of the mind, but it's not, uh, but not amount to insanity. And uh, if somebody proves the diminished diminished responsibility in the courthouse, they could lesser, lesser the gravity of the offense from, uh, uh, from a major crime to lesser one, for example, from murder to manslaughter. Then this is the background of the research. 
relationship between PMS and crime. Due to the behavioral change of women, such as aggression, mood swings, and hallucination may lead to increase of criminal action. Then, this is the literature review. According to Dalton, Dalton is a doctor, Catherine Dalton. She has conducted a number of researches in relation to PMS and crime. And according to her, almost half of the women perpetrators committed alleged crime within the period of menstruation or premenstrual. Then according to Ellis, 63% uh, of women prisoners committed their alleged offenses during they show their symptoms of PMS. Then according to Singh, he's an Indian researcher, he has mentioned that marked behavioral change could be noticed in women who are suffering from PMS such as depression, mood swings, aggression, and these behavioral changes affect the women and they are prone to commit crime from major crime to minor crimes. Then this, this is my research problem. The judiciary of Sri Lanka is unable to procure sufficient room to adopt the PMS as a criminal defense of insanity for total exoneration or else as a diminished responsibility to mitigate the criminal responsibility of women suspects who are suffering from PMS. From this research problem, I am paying special attention to two areas. It means PMS as a criminal defense of insanity for total exoneration, for total exoneration or as a diminished responsibility to mitigate the criminal responsibility. Then these are my research objectives to analyze existing national and international criminal law provisions which address PMS, then to explore the application of diminished responsibility as a mitigatory factor, or defense of insanity as a ground for total exoneration. Then final objective was to suggest possible legal recommendation which could be adopted from foreign jurisdiction to mitigate the criminal responsibility of PMS into Sri Lankan context. Then this is the methodology which I have applied, the qualitative systematic review or qualitative evidence synthesis. And I have uh, used secondary sources such as Penal Code of Sri Lanka and case laws. Uh, and this is the limitation of my research. This work is totally based on internet retrieved articles and journals. And findings, these are my findings. PMS in courthouse in UK and USA. Mm -hmm. I have been applied to three countries, UK, USA, and India. First of all, I'm going to discuss about UK and USA. PMS has applied as a mitigatory factor in English courts. It means to, let's say they have applied, English courts use PMS as a mitigatory factor to lesser the offense. But American criminal courts use PMS as, as a criminal defense for the total exoneration of the crime. Then, Regina versus Craddock, it is an English case. In this case, court held that the, uh, it was the first major case which PMS was applied in the courthouse, and it was applied as a mitigatory factor in English courts. Then, Regina versus English, it is an unreported case in UK. In this court, in this case, the court held that the court lesser the offense of manslaughter instead of murder for woman who is having extreme PS, PMS. Then, final one was USA case, People versus Santos case. In this case, it was the first attempt to apply PMS in the courthouse of USA as a criminal defense of insanity. Then, the salient judgment is Kumari Chandra was a state of Rajasthan. Uh, it was concluded in 2018. Uh, in this case, the uh, perpetrator, Kumar Chandra, had uh, throw three children, her neighboring children, into a well, and out of them, one ch a child was killed and other two were injured. This is the, uh, it, it was the facts of the case. Now we'll move on to the judgment, right? Uh, in, Ingli, in India, a landmark judgment, the High Court of Rajasthan held that P 
PMS could be applied as a defense of insanity in Indian context, context even though it did not contain in, in the penal code as a general defense. It does not contain in the penal code as a gener general defense, but Indian court applied def uh, PMS as a defense of insanity. Then court held that the alleged crime was committed by the perpetrator as an involuntary act without mens rea. The court has mentioned that the mental element was not there, therefore it, it should be an involuntary act due to the unsound of the mind of the particular perpetrator. Then the accused has the opportunity to apply the defense to show that she was suffering from P PSM when the crime was committed because her alleged crime was involuntary act due to her psychological disorder or unsound mind. It means the Indian court has applied PMS as a defense of insanity even though it does not contain in the penal court as a general defense. Then these are my findings, PMS in Sri Lankan context. None of the legislation has mentioned that the PMS as a defense of insanity in the Sri Lankan context from total exoneration from criminal responsibility. And no any legislation has mentioned that PMS can be applied as a mitigatory factor in Sri Lanka to the to lesser the offense from a grave offense. Then none of the reported judgments were uh, arrived to, uh, arrived at the superior courts in the matter of PMS as a defense or mitigatory factor in Sri Lankan context. Then this is the conclusion. The judiciary of Sri Lanka is unable to procure sufficient room to adopt the PMS as a criminal defense of insanity or as a mitigatory factor to mitigate the criminal responsibility of a woman suspect who are suffering from PMS. It means Sri Lankan judiciary system is unable to procure sufficient room to adopt PMS as a criminal defense or as a mitigatory factor up to present. And these are my recommendations. Apply contemporary case laws from foreign jurisdiction for defense of insanity triggered from, from PSM with particular developments which suitable to criminal justice system of Sri Lanka. And second recommendation is amend the relevant penal laws to apply PMS as a criminal defense. Then third recommendation is defense lawyer should be more attentive to apply PMS as a defense in their defense case to defend their defendants in the courthouse. The final recommendation is expert te test, sorry, testamentary of gynecologists and psychiatrists pertaining to PMS could be applied in the courthouse. These are the preferences. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vijaya. Uh, now we'll move to the next speaker, she's, uh, she's R. I. Lianagi, A. S. P. Inoka Lianagi. She will be talking on evolution of community policing in Sri Lanka from the imperialistic era to present. Uh, all the ladies and gentlemen, this is the very important and very interesting topic in uh, Sri Lanka because Sri Lanka police is the important uh, role in engaging with public and law enforcement sector. Uh, community policing is the most important thing in Sri Lanka police. We are engaging with the protecting law and order in the country. So community policing is given more chances to us conducting our duty with respect and uh, accountable for the protecting law and order in the country. First, I would like to talk what is the community policing. 
comment policy is most important topic and the most interesting topic in the police in world committee policy in based on the public committee policy is public is the police and police is the public this was found in by the sir robert peel in uh, former prime minister in uk sir robert peel says police are the public public are the police the concept that the police is the end of the public is the police also implies that uh, society because the police that are built within the society and police are maintained by the society they are the paying all the law enforcement agencies and they are the maintaining all the law enforcement agencies if they are not with us we cannot do in our duty and we cannot go in with the protecting law and order in the country yesterday also sir ajit rohana said about police like a fish fish in the tank they cannot live without water also police with we cannot live without the public because in we need to public to protect the law and order in the country in my research i try to identify why we cannot reach in this concept to fulfill the law and order because this is not new concept in sri lanka it ca comes from kings era also and uh, colonial era it comes with in written but still we are try to identify and try to follow in the community policing concept the sri lanka police vision are shown creating a peaceful environment in which people can live confidently without any fear of crime and violence to reach this vision sri lanka police needs to strong mechanism it is possible to make the community police service a powerful mechanism to prepare this concept due to the successful use of this concept by the development and powerful countries of the world the police service of those countries can be called the most advanced and disciplined police because of their use in conceptual framework gaining public trust especially in the police is not something can be done govern in the our duty and the protecting the law and order here police should be should act very patient and lawful in the country if you are going without public trust and public faith we cannot achieve this vision in the country because to achieve this vision we need public support and the public faith if we not going with the public this is like the wheel of the clock because people are working without given support to police we cannot achieve in the our vision we need more support from the people
as i mentioned here there are three main concept in the community policy one is community partnerships second one is problem solving methods third one is organizational transformation this is the time is organizational transformation we know more and more researchers are doing about the community policy in researchers but the problem is still we cannot reach in the main target of this concept it means gaining faithness and gaining trust worthy with the public my research questions are to identify how the concept of community police gradually spread from empirical era to the present era and how to implement the concept effectively to identify the gap between theory and the practice in community oriented policy i use the qualitative research method to ident uh, to uh, reach in this research uh, finalizing especially uh, we need get more support from the other researchers to conduct in this research history of community pol community policy in this is come from the king's era but still we are studying studying what is the community policy in and trying to learn in why we are and how conducting the community policy in the sri lanka as i stated in section 56 in the police ordinance published in 1865 the police officers must work to protect public order and create a peaceful environment where the public can live without fear and suspicion by prevailing fear of crime the people pay officers salaries and maintain law enforcement agencies with the aim of making their aspiration to live freely and peaceful in the society flourish during the current crisis situation in country the bad experience we make all about the public support and our duty readiness this does not mean supporting or jurisdicting the crimes offenses or mistakes made by the society or public this only means creating a peaceful environment which is the vision of sri lanka police this is the mission of sri lanka police sri lanka police is committed and confident to uphold and enforce the law of the land to preserve the public order prevent crime and terrorism with prejudice to non equity to all the following facts we are revealed through this research the introduction of concept and theories is carried out on the activities of the people who implement them and the success of those theories or concepts that in order to succeed in any theory there is a need for adequate basic training and continuous training especially in order to make the concept of community policy successful the police must be very patient until that opportunity comes and they must move towards their goal by facing the obstacles that come there these are the references 
I, would, I was used. In conclusion, the police service like the really race with the change in baton. They are police officers run over different hurdles. From time to time, different types of officers with different type of challenges and barriers give their energy, sweat, blood, and life to keep their service actual. As elderly senior officers, this is the time has to hand over the baton to you, my younger student officers. That, that we have, that you have equipped with more skills, more knowledge, and also with good attitude to gaining and to achieving our police goals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Lianagi. Now, we can listen to the last speaker. He is Mr. K. S. Dharmasiri. He will be talking to us a study on the effectiveness of vocational training programs for prisoners in Sri Lanka. I would like to present my abstract in IRC 2022 under the technical session of criminal justice. So, uh, so my topic is a study on the effectiveness of vocational training programs for prisoners in Sri Lanka. It has primarily focused on one, uh, on one aspect of the correctional process. Uh, so this is the outline of the presentation. So I would like to talk about the introduction, research problem, research object objectives, and methodology, results, and discussion conclusion and finally references. Introduction. When we consider about the introduction of the presentation, first of all, I would like to say uh, there are several objective of the prison services. So uh, rehabilitation and reformation are the primary function uh, of prison services in modern society. So when it comes to define the prisoner, uh, we can consider the Prison Security Act in 1992. So uh, who is the prisoner? The prisoner is a legal term uh, for a person who is incarcerated, and it refers to any person who is currently detained in legal custody because of a court order or other legal requirement. OK, so when we consider about the concept of the rehabilitation, uh, according to the Linden and Perry, uh, Perry uh, according to the Linden and Perry, uh, they mention about the what is rehabilitation. So the rehabilitation is the process of uh, removing or reducing as far as possible the factors that limit the activity and participation of a person with a disability so that he can attain and maintain the highest possible level of independence and quality of life, physically, mentally, socially, and vocationally. So it's mean rehabilitation is the process of removing, reducing, and uh, controlling the offender's behavior. So uh, we can identify the different types of rehabilitation programs in the prison system. Uh, so those are educational programs, uh, economical programs, social programs, cultural programs, religious programs, and health rehabilitation programs. So when we talk about the what is the vocational training programs, it means vocational training programs are another rehabilitation technique introduced to prisons to develop their skills. This helps to find a vocation to sustain himself after his release and enables him to earn wages while serving in prison, according to the Linden and Perry. So, in this slide, you can see the correctional process which is followed in Sri Lanka, and this diagram helps to identify the uh, process of uh, correctional process of Sri Lanka. So, when we consider about the correctional process of Sri Lanka, we can identify the two types of correctional process. The first one is the institutional corrections, and second one is the community correction. So, 
When we consider about the institutional corrections, we can see rehabilitation programs. In the Sri Lanka, in the closed prisons, we can see different types of rehabilitation program, including social rehabilitation programs, uh, educational rehabilitation programs, economic rehabilitation programs, health rehabilitation programs, and religious rehabilitation program. But my topic is vocational training program. So when we consider about the vocational training programs under the educational rehabilitation programs and under the economic rehabilitation programs, we can get it as a uh, more uh, re uh, rehabilitation program in the correctional process. So uh, when we uh, consider about the Sri Lankan vocational training programs, uh, Sri Lankan prisons offers several vocational training programs for prisoners. So uh, those are agriculture, canning, and carpentry, handloom, soap making, tailoring, and weaving, as well as other training programs. So under the vocational training programs of the prisons are training offenders with humanity and helping them uh, lead a useful life in society as law-abiding citizens after their release from prisons. So this is my research problem. So when we consider about the problem of the study, uh, all those substantial provisions have been made. The impact of vocational training programs on the lives of inmates in Sri Lankan prisons is questionable. In addition, it is questionable whether the specialized training inmates receive in prison is truly beneficial for their survival after they reintegrate into society and whether they build a successful future and the nature of the contribution of vocational training programs must be investigation. So this is the objective of the research. So uh, the objective of the research is to determine the effectiveness of vocational training programs conducted for inmates in Sri Lanka by focusing on the experiences and perspectives of trainers who engage in providing vocational training programs for inmates. So this is the methodology part of my study. Uh, when we consider about the methodology of the presentation, the study area was a uh, close prison in Sri Lanka, special reference to Valikada prison. And also the sampling method was pur purposive sampling method. And the sample size was five trainers. And data collection method was a uh, structured interviews method. And data analysis method uh, was a thematic analysis method. So, uh, when we are doing the research, uh, we have to pay attention to the uh, limitations. In this slide, I would like to talk about the limitations of the study. Those are uh, conceptual limitations, geograph uh, geographical limitations, and sampling limitations. So when we consider about the conceptual limitations of the study, I only focus about the convict convicted prisoners in Sri Lanka, those who are stay at uh, close prisons in uh, Sri Lanka and the concept of rehabilitation and the vocational training programs. In other than that, I focus about the geographical limitations. So those are uh, close prisons in Sri Lanka, special reference to Valikada prison. And thirdly, sampling limitation. Uh, I choose purposive sampling method and five trainers and only use structured interview method to gather in my data. Experimental design. According to the literature review of the study, this is the experimental design for the data collection. Actually, uh, the data collection was based on five characteristics. In this case, I paid attention to how to affect vocational training programs for prisoners in Sri Lanka. So those are reactions of prisoners, learning of prisoners, interrelationships of the prisoners, cost avoidance, incentives obtaining. Results and discussion. Here is the important part of the presentation. Uh, from this slide, I would like to talk about the results and discussion. 
so in this slide, I mentioned details about the resource uh, persons of the study. Uh, the first trainer specialized in uh, tailoring and uh, bag manufacturing. Uh, the second, second one was the vocational instructor. He was experienced with the hair cutting, tailoring, uh, bakery items, and handloom. Uh, third one was the jailer. Uh, he was experienced with the carpentry and agriculture. And fourth one is the, was the jailer. Uh, he was experienced with the agriculture. And fifth one was the uh, vocational instructor. He was experienced with uh, broomsticks, brooms, uh, soap, oil, bakery items. Uh, there were positive answers to these questions. So effectiveness is determined the uh, pleasure of the prisoners. So according to the prisoners, uh, according to the resource persons, uh, there was a motivation of prisoners to learn and active participation and willingness. And participation can be evaluated based on the offenders' training attendance and punctuality and capacity to withstand the length of the session. And vocational training program is the essential fact for release on license system. Therefore, their attitude was very positive. So when we consider about the learning of prisoners, under the educational programs, vocational training program is a method to improve prisoner, prisoners' knowledge regarding vocational knowledge. All the participant, participants in the study uh, agreed that many of the inmates have lack of basic knowledge about these practice, practices, uh, but all the inmates who participated in the uh, training session were able to learn everything. The best example is what are the product they produce in the prison. So most prisoners use their free time to create art which gives them satisfaction. So when we consider about the interrelationships of the inmates, Inmates are very supportive and enthusiastic. Uh, the prisoners have the quality of mutual regard for each other. Uh, they demonstrate mutual understand the respect for their leaders during training sessions. Uh, cost avoidance, improve post release job prospects. Vocational training can reduce staffing cost, uh, utility, uh, utility rates, inmates meals, clothing, and other prison costs. Uh, costs. Uh, so, and finally, cost avoidance is an advantage to the government. So, uh, fifth one is the incentives obtaining. Uh, there are many financial and non-financial incentives in place to get offenders to uh, take part in these programs. Uh, in terms of monetary incentives, uh, those who do the right thing will have money put into their bank accounts. The people in the program get paid every day. Under non-monetary incentives, convicts are entitled to home leave. When prisoners uh, finish batik, weaving, and tailoring, they get an NVQ certificate also. So this is the conclusion. Uh, a vocational training program is part of the correctional education system. The Department of Corrections has done a lot of make sure that vocational training programs in prisons are more effective. They want to make these programs work better and get more prisoners to take part. They are willing to join training programs for a number of different reasons. These programs help prisoners get to know each other and their trainers. When they get out of prison, people who work of themselves can help uh, the economical and uh, educational perspective. So thank you so much. This is the reference, and uh, thank you. So thank you, Mr. Dalmasiri, for your presentation. Uh, the rapporteurs are doing, uh, I mean, the mistake because always showing the time and all we, you know, depriving us to listen to all this, you know. Uh, the very important <laughs> and uh, the good presentations. We were, I think that uh, the two discussions also told me that you know how they have actually impressed about this, the, uh, the papers, uh, and they said that uh, this faculty has a, uh, a very good future.
<laughs> right? So having said that, uh, I want to give uh, the, I mean, audience uh, to, I mean, ask the, uh, so uh, now we can open the forum for question and answers. Uh, we have five speakers. Uh, so the audience can ask the questions from uh, the five speakers. Actually, we don't have the space and to, I mean, to look at their face, but uh, I think you know uh, the, our first speaker is Dr. Nishara Mendis. The second uh, speaker was uh, Tushara Katriya Rachi. Third uh, speaker, Aruni Vijaya. Fourth speaker, Ino Kaliyanage. The fifth speaker, Mr. Dharma Siri. And uh, I hope that you very carefully listen to the five uh, the speeches. Therefore, you can ask any question from uh, any uh, of the, uh, the presenter. Since they are, I mean, your teachers, I think that they will just, you know, have to, uh, I mean, look back and you can have a good deliberation. Actually, uh, I got the message that we, uh, we see having a very, I mean, uh, he's so impressive on our, the program. Therefore, I uh, got an information asking whether we can drag this little bit until he comes because he also wants to listen to you and, you know, the, especially the discussions. So uh, it is, uh, I mean, if you can have, you know, a very good deliberation, uh, we can uh, wait until he comes uh, to conclude this session before summing up. Uh, so any question from uh, So uh, I think the two discussions also, if you have any questions, the clarifications, some suggestions, you know, to further develop your the papers. Uh, now it is uh, the time for you. So, who would like to start? I couldn't listen to the first session, but I read the theme. So, I would like to uh, the way the integration of humanities and social sciences could enhance the humane aspect of the law or the administration of criminal justice. In the case of law, we have to be objective. That is the quality of the law. But still, being objective, we have to be humane. So how to enhance the humane aspect, uh, getting the contribution of all the social sciences, especially the psychology and the other cultural anthropology like. Because they are talking about the value, value base and all. A mother must be sentenced to a particular term of imprisonment, but the mother's role is a decisive role in the family. There we have to uh, listen to the humane aspect of uh, the role of mother while administering, uh, administering the justice. Uh, maybe I'll stand up. Uh, yes, sir, thank you for the question. Uh, I was uh, focusing on criminal justice professionals, but with a very, uh, uh, like looking at my students, uh, so I was really thinking about uh, your role in the future. Uh, so not so much about lawyers and judges, but about the police. And uh, I think this linked with the uh, presentation made by uh, Mrs. Inoka Lienage about community policing. So my uh, key take home word for you to remember was empathy, which is something a little bit uh, about understanding or putting yourself in the shoes of the other person, understanding the other person's life. And that is how you can be the fish in water. As uh, was said yesterday by Dr. Ajit Rohana, you have to fully understand the life experiences of other people, not just your own life, but understand their life. And uh, it has often been said, um, I remember there was a speech by uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was a famous Russian author, writer, who got the Nobel Prize for literature. 
And in that uh, Nobel Prize speech, he said, there is only one way that you can live the life of another person, and that is through art and literature. So that is why I am uh, encouraging this idea. So I hope I answered your questions. Uh, I know, uh, Dr. Nishara, you are doing, uh, I mean, the literature also. We are talking always how that literature can, art and literature uh, can include to, I mean, enhance our course curriculum and all. Uh, just a general question I am asking. Think of uh, that as you suggested uh, to, I mean, include different course modules for our subject. Uh, so have you, uh, I mean, uh, in this research as well as have you any, uh, the, have you uh, identified any the area that uh, we can really enhance, uh, I mean, taking arts and humanities uh, to, I mean, enhance the empathy towards the two of these, you know, working with that the police officers uh, to, I mean, any specific area, I mean, you know, how that uh, you can support us uh, if you are going to go for a different course module or something. Uh, thank you for your question, madam. Uh, I think something that we discussed very briefly uh, on one occasion was uh, actually about uh, continuing the practice that uh, some have already experienced in the police academy with the screening of films, but to do it in an academic manner, to understand about film review in an academic manner. So I think one of the things that could be done was maybe develop the film club, film uh, recommendations, documentary movie recommendations, uh, that can be an activity that you will enjoy. But before that, to uh, present to you all how to do a film critique, uh, not just as a normal viewer, but in a slightly more academic way. So I think that is one of the things that we could introduce as an extracurricular activity, uh, which we can do without uh, too much uh, problems. So, yes, Nishara, I thought that, you know, when we had, we'll have our next curriculum revamp in another three years period, so definitely we can add uh, a new course curriculum, I mean, including uh, the, I mean, what she suggested for us. Thank you very much. Yes, any question from... Uh, the learned audience? Then may I have a right? May I have a question from uh, Miss Ino Kaliyanage because it is one of my another interesting area about community policing. Uh, uh, Miss Inoka, uh, can you please tell us uh, now? This is uh, actually when you were talking about Robert Peel. Aruni talk about uh, why the reason was uh, Robert Keel was, you know, attempted to kill, right, under McNaughton rules, <laughs> right? It's a little bit of a, I mean, extension. You started with uh, the good side of uh, Robert Peel, uh, so she, I mean, indirectly said that, you know, what is the other side. Anyway, so um, uh, the way, as far as the community policing is concerned, there are uh, the different police divisions are adopting different uh, the policies and all. Uh, so what do you think that if we can implement the whistleblowing system as one of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the one, uh, the, let's say, or policy or something uh, to the community policing, do you think that we can get uh, more support from uh, that if you include that? So even uh, any, I mean, uh, Professor also can add something if you know that, but uh, this is a question I just want to ask you because you are coming from police. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam, for your questions. Especially in the whistleblowing system, we are adding the community policing because of we need to get the support from the uh, public. 
if we are not if they are not supporting to us we cannot implement in the community policy because community policy is the public is the police police is the public it's look like uh, if we are doing some duty public are not given the support it's con conducting our duty we cannot complete it if we are, we are uh, gaining the, our goal. That's why we are including whistleblowing system and also in the uh, some areas of uh, now we are thinking about in how the uh, I'm uh, discussed with uh, Madam Nishara in we need to em empowering our officers empathy because of if they are not working with the empathy uh, duty, empathistic duty, we cannot reach into the public. It's, it's a, some different and the gap with the police and the public. The, uh, I'm uh, trying to identify this, the, what is the reason for the gap because mm -hmm. of the empathy. I think because of the empathy, because if you are wearing uniform, we are thinking we have to keep some distance from the public. That's, it's wrong. We need to uh, broke this gap in uniformity and the civilians. That's we are trying to implement in the community policy system in Sri Lanka. We have it, we are still practicing it, but still we cannot reach in the goal. That is the issue we with, I'm discussing this topic. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Liyanagi, yes. Uh, so, so you can ask the question because we, we won't be able to get this type of, uh, the, I mean, the yeah, feedback and uh, from your, the, the good audience that you can ask the questions from your, the, I mean, your, all your teachers are here. I don't think that they, you don't feel any shy and all because every day you're talking to them. Sometimes in the classroom, I know that the heated argument, especially with me, that when you put some argument, so then all come with that, uh, the different, uh, the views. So yes, yes, Lakal, very good. Yeah. Madam, uh, so community policy, madam, so uh, only the police can't make it work, I think. The community policy, there, there should be collaboration with other law enforcement agencies also. So do you think, Madam, in Sri Lanka, that mechanism works for uh, the aims that we are considering of, uh, when we are considering of, uh, considering of community policing, uh, the collaboration of other law enforcement agencies? Is it working uh, for the cause of community policing, Madam? other than the police. I think, uh, <laughs> Madam, uh, this is the forum for that because we are discussing about criminal justice, Lakal. Criminal justice is the uh, in law enforcement system developing this forum. Because uh, we are in here from yesterday with the all the law enforcement agencies in the morning, I discussed with Madam, we missed some special point in the uh, yesterday forum because of the uh, medical side. Uh, Lakal, uh, we have the system and also we are training you for the community policy with engaging the, all the law enforcement agencies in Sri Lanka in here for three years. I think you will get answer end of the course in this uh, defense college. Thank you. Madam, uh, am I right? Yes. So in my summing up, I will little bit explain. Right. So any question from the students? Because I think that that is the, uh, this, uh, uh, the main, one of the main objectives is that, you know, to if you have any doubts, you can clear with uh, the presenters. So if you have something to add and comment, that is also possible, right? Because after that, I think uh, we are, I mean, developing our, yes, our, the, uh, the, the papers, including all what you suggested. Good morning, ladies and ah, gentlemen. Yes. Uh, oh. 
Uh, first of all, I would like to tell you uh, all about this. This is a great honor and privilege, and it is a great opportunity that we have to witness such a uh, good areas uh, that uh, the, all the present speakers who have speak or spoke today, uh, they have focused into several areas, good areas. Uh, but uh, one point uh, about the Dr. Nishara, madam, uh, the the area uh, which has attracted my uh, focus because uh, when we consider the European countries such as UK and other countries, they most of the time they are, they, they are available the uh, courts such as uh, equity courts in order to deal with such a, a situation which was emphasized by, by, by the Professor uh, uh, Danapala sir also. Um, Madam, my uh, question is um, the empathy, the fact that you have, have emphasized the empathy, uh, it has to, uh, whether it, is, it should be focused towards or to the all the society or just to a part uh, uh, such as judiciary or other legal uh, uh, police, such as departments like police department and other areas or whether it has to be focused towards the total society because the criminals are also born from the society. If uh, the people or the society has the liberty and the right to enjoy the right, actual right uh, which they deserve, it will, it will uh, definitely reduce the crime rate as well as it will definitely support the criminal justice system. So uh, my uh, question is, ma'am, whether it has to pre be focused towards to the entire society or to a, a particular part, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, I think you all are thinking about uh, why is it that if in society there are people who are getting this kind of education and yet do not seem to be behaving in, you know, accordance with law and order or uh, with sensitivity to um, other persons in society. Um, so, yes, we cannot change everybody uh, and the effectiveness of education Sometimes I personally think if you teach a hundred people, maybe one person will actually implement that education. So <laughs> I have to say that if we teach all of society, uh, liberal arts or arts and humanities, out of hundred people, maybe one person will be more empathetic, more law abiding, maybe more uh, of a better citizen than they would have been without the education. So once again, it is my personal view, uh, we do our best with trying to educate and create empathy in people. It does not change everybody. It may change one out of a hundred, maybe five out of a hundred to be better than otherwise. So that is my personal view. Uh, so I do believe, yes, Everyone in society, all school children uh, from the youngest age, all uh, professionals uh, should have this aspect. Uh, so it is not only directed towards a particular group. However, as I emphasized in my presentation, uh, this, there is a particular criticism of criminal justice professionals as being, let's say, too harsh, too hard, uh, uh, too um, focused on control and that uh, if you want to change the system as you has been suggested from within the system uh, this is maybe one method that can be used so this is all based on things that have come out of the research for this particular profession as well for lawyers judges also this is true in the same way uh, so I won't deny that every single profession this also applies, it also applies to every single uh, citizen as well. But I don't think that education always changes everyone, it may change some people. Sarah, uh, so any question from any other? May I ask? Uh, oh, one contribution. Oh, yes. One contribution, okay. So the empathy, whether it is for the society or an individual, em empathy is coming from the counseling and Actually, we take things for granted. That is the problem. Even the case of a person, loss or whatever things are taken for granted. When work on that particular mentality, 
there would be various injustices. So the police officers, so criminal justice officers need to empathize. That means without experiencing the particular problem, one must understand the particular repercussion or uh, feeling or attitude the person has really experienced. So that, that must be there. The police officers must be able to empathize. That means they are not experiencing the problem, the other party experiences, but the real feeling must be felt by the same person to administer the law. That is a good psychological quality one must have. Yes. So at the same time, I will, uh, to do justice, are the three people, uh, other presenters. One question that I'm uh, raising regarding the particular, uh, the related to the war, uh, we have reservations on the Darusman report. It has been highly criticized. So uh, to what extent it is uh, reasonable to take a single report of Darusman uh, for uh, uh, developing such an argument? The second, with reference to the PMS, uh, uh, they are, uh, what is required is to amend the law so that it may address such uh, uh, personal or uh, gender-based things. So there are the problem is to what extent the gender aspect has been addressed the law, be it a masculinity, be it a femininity, both are equally important. Now the law is equal to all while protecting the equality. If there are gender-based, biological, psychological, or any other social differences, they must be addressed in the law first, then the judges are, the law enforcement officers are able to administer the criminal justice in terms of that. So that, that, that is a requirement of the amendment of law. With reference to our Dharma city, they are uh, the rehabilitation, but the prisons are there to uh, what, they impose the law, uh, the sentence being given that must be implemented by the a prison. So the punishment is also going there. So that we have to distinguish between the punishment and rehabilitation. So that aspect must be at this. Whether the rehabilitation is there in the law. Prison is doing rehabilitation. But we have to check the law whether the court is punishing or rehabilitating. Court is punishing. That particular uh, problem is there in our law. That must be seriously taken into account. Those are the three to do the justice to all. May I ask a question? Because I want to see that pair by all my uh, the faculties, right? So uh, for the next question is to, to Shara. Uh, that is, you focused uh, on fully on Darusman report. But we all are aware thereafter that LLRC has come. As a result of the LLRC, now we have OR, OMP, and uh, ONUR, and all to, I mean, carry out what they have suggested because of that, as you very correctly said, that the allegations pointed out against uh, the uh, uh, Darusman report. So if I can remember correct, very long time back, uh, this was the first uh, uh, international conference here. I gave the nice answer to Darusman report being <laughs> doing my research on that, right? Uh, very much similar to what you, he has suggested. Anyway, so then I just want to have a yeah, question, since you are also a re re uh, retired military personnel. Do you think that we had a war, the LTT, that uh, whatever that we had something, right? So then uh, would you like to define or interpret that as a war or in a different way? Because it gives a whole, uh, the, I mean, the path is open either to take this side or that side. I hope that's what I'm trying to say. Yes, ma'am. Right? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you for your uh, valuable question. Uh, that is why, ma'am, I was focusing on the nature of the war we had. It is not a conventional war that we had fought with the LTT. It was an unconventional warfare. Although the term, as you said, that uh, I had used was war, it was a war of a different nature because uh, it was uh, the parties were not uh, legitimate uh, parties uh, at a war because only the military was uh, legitimately had a right to fight 
to preserve the territorial integrity of the country and preserve national security as well. Because uh, at a uh, situation like that, ma'am, in the so-called war, because if uh, there, were, there were situations where other countries were also uh, involved in this, uh, uh, so the battle or the strife between the parties, and it, there were times, if we can remember even the IPKF uh, involvement, there were times where the LTT were supported directly or indirectly by other countries. So it was kind of, it was turned to be kind of a war in that sense. But anyway, my focus of the presentation was whether the, our legitimate army was, a, was fighting a conventional war for them to adhere to all the norms of the uh, IHL, laws of war. Because uh, in uh, unconventional warfare, because of the tactics used by the other parties or the belligerents, the legitimate force is unable to, in many situations, unable to stick to sometimes the real rules of war. So it is inevitable because the battleground situation is subjected to changes. Yes, we plan the war. There are strategies and we plan the war. But still, on-ground situation is quite uh, unforeseen in a situation of uh, imbalance warfare. There's a power imbalance between the parties in terms of uh, the num numerical uh, power of the group and also means and methods of warfare. So, so the resources are not the same. So the LTT, they, most of the time, they resorted to uh, unconventional means and methods of warfare. So it is, as I mentioned yeah, during my presentation, the Darusman report was not authenticated. Yes. And uh, I just uh, took it as an example of the level, leveling of allegations towards uh, our forces. But it's our responsibility to strike a balance. Anyway, we had to clear our name uh, in the, within the international community. And for that, and we have to prepare ourselves for future, you know, threats and also we would have, uh, not only threats of, for the national security, but also future threats, uh, future allegations of this nature. Because we had to prepare our forces and we need the support of the police as well to yes. preserve law and order in all, in all contexts, not only uh, the public order, the police uh, support is also required for even in the course of preserving national security. Thank you. I think that may be the reason it is said that humanitarian operation. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? Okay. That Thank is, you very much. Yes. That is, that is what I want to raise. Yeah, yeah. The war is having a general meaning. But here in Sri Lanka, we adopted the humanitarian operation. Then the Putin has adopted special military operation. So they are not using the term war for that uh, Ukraine conflict. So using the war is having a particular complex situation and two parties are there and they, they have other party also having all the war entitlements. But when it is a special military operation, it is one party uh, doing justice to liberate. Here we all also had that. So we have to get these conceptual meanings instead of the general jargon of war. That is my point. Okay, thank you very much, all the contributions and the answer. Uh, so now we'll move to Ms. Aruni. Uh, you are very, I mean, trying to focus on one of the gray area of our penal laws, actually. Uh, so then uh, uh, you are trying to say that uh, taking uh, some Indian cases and the different other jurisdictions uh, to say that uh, insanity, that is Section 77, is not really, I mean, uh, is able to cover all the aspects of the different, uh, the, uh, the mens rea situation when it comes to the insanity. There's a mental disorder. It's a kind of mental disorder that PEMS also what you uh, referred. So uh, would you say that uh, when it comes to uh, the changes or the amendments or the reforms to our law, taking into consideration what you focused on here, right? What kind of the theory or the concept can 
be taken into consideration to develop that. You came with uh, two, uh, diminished responsibility and uh, an acquittal. Here we have either side, either conviction or acquittal. But when it comes to, thanks to Mental Disorder Act in the UK, the IC, you know, the legalized everything, where that the different status are there, then how that have to, I mean, diminish the responsibility means, you know, reduce the punishment. So then the USA is considered as a def uh, defense, but it is not PMS as per se. It is taken into consider consideration automatism. Therefore, uh, do you think that uh, if we include automatism as a, uh, the concept in order to justify what you are saying and include into our, uh, the penal code, don't you think that it is good, uh, uh, I mean, mean to overcome this issue? What do you think yes. of it? Thank you very much, madam, for the question. Yes, I believe that uh, in Garmini versus AG AG. case, they have the court tried to apply the automatism, but at that time they were failed. But I think if, uh, under the section 77 of penal code, we can directly apply the PMS as a method of insanity. And uh, because Indian Penal Code, Section 84 of Indian Penal Code, it has, uh, it has mentioned about the defense of insanity. The same wordings are used in our Penal Code at Section 77. So I believe that we can directly apply PMS as a, the, as a defense in Sri Lankan context while regarding the case of uh, Kumari Chandra versus State of Rajasthan. So yeah, the UK also applied PMS as a diminished responsibility. So it is uh, the, whether we could apply it as a diminished responsibility of defense of insanity, it is, as I believe, it is the duty of the judiciary. Uh, if, the, whether, uh, if the evidence are uh, presented in the courthouse, then the, especially the expert evidence, gynecologist and psychiatrist, pay their attention to this disorder and uh, after receiving the evidence they can measure the they can uh, use a mechanism to evaluate what is the position of the particular defendant and they can apply whether she's suffering from a severe or a moderate disorder then they can apply uh, they can give evidence in relation to that that case then the judges uh, may may give the solution for that and but I believe that actually we can use uh, PMS as a uh, as a um, general defense in Sri Lankan context if you are uh, following the uh, uh, that Indian judgment you mean that as a separate defense as a, not at, as a separate defense as a uh, as a defense of insanity it can be categorized as a defense of insanity because uh, under that you are telling that you know at one aspect yeah so one aspect only. one two three like yeah that. yeah there are so that means uh, it goes to uh, uh, the diminished responsibility mm. or that you know the full uh, the, uh, yeah. acquittal 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 yeah acquittal we can use pms as for total extra exoneration of that offense because Indian uh, Indian judges have applied that because they acquit that lady who is who was suffering from PMS. So in short, what you say is it can be brought under Section 77, that yeah. is insanity. Yes, sir. And and the defense can have that as a defense. Of course, as a general defense. As a general defense. Yeah. Therefore, it should be proven that at the time of the commission of the offense, the defendant does not know what she is yeah. doing. Yeah. And if she knows that, she does not know the nature yeah. and know what she is doing contrary to law or what, I mean, whether she is doing wrong, Kulti. Yeah. That and to comply these the three aspects. Yeah, no? and soundness of the mind. mind. It means men's right is not there. There. Thank you. Okay, thank you, madam. Thank you, sir. We all are lawyers, no? We want to see <laughs> that whether it's really good uh, suggestion. Yes. 
So the one last question. Uh, however, I am so satisfied and happy with the, all the five presenters, what they brought us here, and to enlighten us uh, about uh, their rec uh, recent uh, research uh, the findings. However, I uh, invite all the five presenters. Please consider what the I mean the and this discussion forum what the uh, the audience uh, suggested and uh, came with some queries about your presentations in the sense you know to develop that including uh, those uh, the suggestions please develop your papers and uh, submit to the the conference book it will be published that you know we want to see that all your full papers are published in there with all the comments. So thank you very much for participating and presenting and questioning and being with us for the first technical session. So after now we can release you for tea. After that, yes, once again, come back to the second uh, technical session. So thank you very much. Before you stand up, you give a, you know, the big uh, the flow, the roundup to all the presenters who have done marvelous job while they are doing all the work to organize this conference. Yes. Thank you.